Welcome to another episode of The Bible's Greatest Mysteries from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and I'm very sorry to say this is our last program with Dr. Heiser until we get interviews with him again. <laughs> He's so gracious to share his time He's with us. He's so and we, busy. He is. He is. He's got uh, a school of theology mm -hmm. that he has basically designed the cur curriculum for, and he's doing the teaching, and uh, students from all over the world via online learning are, are mm -hmm. taking advantage of his... We are blessed to have known Mike for, oh gosh, since 2005 when we first mm -hmm. reached out to him and interviewed him with a, a hybrid setup that we jury-rigged with parts from there Radio was Shack. and, and gum and, you know... <laughs> And Cardboard. God bless him. He has been gracious enough to share time with us over the years and to allow us to uh, pick his brain and access this, this knowledge. He shares it so freely, and yet it is so essential to understanding some of the stranger parts of the Bible. As Mike loves to say, and we love to quote, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's, it's important. important. Well, this week he discusses something that I think is it's foundational. If you don't understand oh. this concept, you really won't understand the Bible. I see Tom Horn in his uh, weekly assignment saved the best for last this yeah, week for he discussion did. with uh, confidential. Mike. Confidential. Yeah. Can we be talking about this? It says confidential. <laughs> only, only in the context of this room. Ah. Yes. We, we've swept it for bugs, so we're all safe here. But no, the divine counsel is a concept that we see in Psalm chapter 82, mm -hmm. and Mike openly says that this is what got him started down this line of research. A friend of his, as they were attending Bible college, basically said, hey, have you read Psalm 82? What do you think of it? And Mike read that. God takes his place. Well, let me, let me bring up the verse here so oh, that yes, I don't... Please. Uh, reading from the English Standard Version, but uh, this is a, uh, a passage that is... It's worthy of a description. film. Just this passage well, is it, worthy it really of a is. film. really is. Psalm 82, beginning at verse 1, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, in the midst of the gods, don't, don't he holds scared. judgment. Don't start thinking that we're going down the pantheon thing. We're not. Right. And that's where Mike's like, well, now wait a minute. Who are these Elohim? Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds mm -hmm. judgment. Now, Elohim, like deer in English, can be singular or plural, depending on the context, or sheep. But clearly here, he can't stand in the midst of himself. So God... Yahweh mm -hmm. takes his place in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. And then further down, verse 6, he, he, uh, he, quoting God, I said, you are gods, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. This is a courtroom scene where God condemns these lesser Elohim, fallen angels, if you will, um, for ruling the earth or administering the earth unjustly. Oh, I know. It's so exciting. Well, we're not going to talk about it anymore. We're going to let the expert tell you why the Divine Council concept is so important. So part four with Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike, the work that first attracted Sharon and me to you back in, I think, 2005 was your work on something called the Divine Council. What is the Divine Council? Yeah, the Divine Council in simplest terms is the heavenly host you know we can we can say the heavenly hosts that are loyal to god i think that that's an important qualification there but it's still imprecise you know because the divine council has hierarchy and you know levels just like congress would okay uh you, you'll see that the phrase academically in academic writing you know, divine council, divine assembly, but it, it's really the heavenly host, those, those beings that are in the service of God in some way. And some of those beings he allows to participate in decisions. You actually see meetings in scripture of God with his heavenly host, and, and they're called a council to make certain decisions. Biblically, I think the clearest passage to this is Psalm 82, uh, because you, you, you get very explicit language there. And as I relate in Unseen Realm, this was sort of a watershed passage for me. The first time I was challenged to read this in Hebrew, Psalm 82, 1 says, Elohim nitzav ba'adat el. So Elohim, very familiar term for God. Nitzav is a singular verbal. It's a participle. So one God, capital G-O-D, stands or takes his stand in the adat el, the council of el or the council of God or the divine council. And then the next line is, the care of Elohim Yishpot. Notice the word Elohim occurs again. 
it says, in the midst of the Elohim, he, the first one, passes judgment. So you look at Psalm 82, and you have a very clear reference to a council that God is presiding over, and that council is made up of other Elohim, other gods. Sounds like a pantheon. You get down to verse 6, and they're mentioned again. When the, the first, again, God is speaking, he said, I said to all of you, you are all Elohim. Okay, there it is again. Sons of the Most High, B'nai Elion, but you're going to die like mortals. That's not good <laughs> if you're one of those guys. No. Verses 2 through 5 explains why God is angry at them. So this is not the Trinity. Okay, these multiple Elohim, this is not the Trinity because God isn't saying to the Trinity, the other members of the Trinity, you guys are corrupt and you're going to die like mortals. You know? it, it, you know, the, so the Trinity is not even on the radar here. And so this is the one of the major passages. Psalm 89 is another one, has the same council language, the same sons of God, sons of the Most High. There is only one Most High, and so it's sons of God in Psalm 82, Psalm 89. And the council is in the skies. You know, it's in the heavenly realms, okay? So we're not talking about people. Okay, this, the gods aren't men here, even though lots of commentators will say that. Yeah. Which is absurd when you think about it for all sorts of reasons. We're also not talking about idols. Okay, idols are not on God's payroll. Okay, God doesn't meet with idols. Idols aren't going to get sentenced to die because they're just blocks of wood and stone. Okay, what's behind the idol or what was thought to live in the idol when you opened its mouth or performed some other ritual act to animate the idol, you, you believed as a pagan that some real deity, real entity came and lived inside that object or attached itself to it. So we're not talking about pieces of wood and stone. We're not talking about people. We're talking about supernatural beings that are being judged by God in a council, in a council meeting. And there, there are four or five you know, pretty clear you know, divine council meetings uh, in Scripture. There's you know, 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. There's Daniel 4. Where, where one of the watchers uh, goes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, hey, king, you know, because you're an arrogant jerk, you're going to go insane for a while. <laughs> Just thought you'd want to know. Well, and what's really, interesting, has, what's really yeah. interesting about that passage is that that actually says this punishment is by decree yeah. of the watchers. Yeah, it says this, this, this judgment is the, by the decree of the watchers, by, by the, you know, the, the verdict is by, you know, decision of the holy ones. They're, and it's plural. And you get down to verse 25, it, the, the language is repeated where it's, the verdict is, you know, decreed by, handed down by the Most High. So it's important that we realize the council isn't like some rogue entity, okay? That it's God and his council. But there's still a council, and, and the watcher says, hey, we, we decided you're an idiot, <laughs> so you need to be taught a lesson. Uh, you got Daniel 7, which is a classic divine council passage. Ancient of days is seated. You know, the, the Son of Man, the one coming on the clouds is there. He, he receives the kingdom. But, but it says the court sat. Okay, the council sits, again, to render judgment. Specifically, they're meeting about what's going to go on with the four beasts, you know, in, in the first part of Daniel 7. And, and basically, they're going to be toast. And the Son of Man is going to inherit the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, where in Daniel 2, it's the kingdom made without hands, which is the kingdom of God. So we know who the Son of Man is. That, that's not rocket science. You know, but, but again, you have a meeting. God allows his, these lesser entities to participate. Now, I have found that people get freaked out by the Elohim language. Okay? And, and we, the reason why we do is because this is the way we're taught as Westerners and as Christians. We're taught that when you see the letters G, O, and D on a screen or on a piece of paper, oh, my brain's telling me that G, O, D means a specific set of unique attributes like omniscience, omnipresence, eternality, okay? It doesn't. You know, that, that's not the way that a biblical writer thought about Elohim. And you don't have to take my word for it. OK, what you do is you look up, you know, and it, it would take you a while unless you have software. It's, it's 2000 plus times. But the biblical writers will use Elohim of things that are not the God of Israel. That alone tells you it's not about attributes, because if it was about attributes, they'd only use the word Elohim for one of those. OK, they'd only use it for Yahweh, but they don't. They use it for you know, members of the council, Psalm 82, 1. 
You have the gods of the foreign nations, like in 1 Kings 11, 33. you got a few gods listed there, and they're called Elohim. You've got the Shadim, which your English translations will have as demons mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy 32, 17. These are, the, again, the, these territorial entities put over part, you know, geographical nations or regions that Israel commits idolatry with. You know, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17 in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, 22, to warn believers to not have fellowship with demons. I mean, Paul obviously believes demons are real, and he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17 as his proof text for don't go, you know, eat the meat that is part of these temple rituals. You know, don't participate in this because you can't be a partaker of the table of demons and the partaker of the table with the Lord. You know, you you have all these things. First Samuel 28, 13, the departed deceased dead are called Elohim. Mm -hmm. Again, no Israelite in his right mind is going to think my dead aunt or uncle has the same attributes as the God of Israel. Like they're ontologically equal. Well, they're both called Elohim, Mike. Well, yeah, they are. But it, this ought to tell you that the term's not about attributes. All, all it is, it's like it's a term like spirits. Mm -hmm. hooked. You would use the word Elohim to describe an entity in the spiritual world who is by nature disembodied. That's all it is. So in, in biblical theology, yeah, there are lots of gods, okay? There are lots of Elohim. All they are is spirit beings, okay, in the spirit world. The spirit world's an a populated place. But only one of those Elohim are Yahweh, hmm. period. End of story. And But that theology doesn't come from the word. It comes from the fact that this one, Yahweh, is described in very specific ways like omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and those attributes are denied to all other Elohim. So our theology that we have is, is good theology, but it doesn't come from the term Elohim. So we don't need to be afraid when we hit Psalm 82 and see lots of Elohim. They're all, oh, I have to be a polytheist now. No, <laughs> no. Okay, let, I mean, let's try to think a little more clearly than this. But that impulse is why you get so many commentators that just say, well, the gods here are men. Just trying to avoid having to deal with a, uh, a uh, theologically complex situation is just easier yeah. to avoid it altogether and dumb it down. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, on my podcast, I get the question so many times because Jesus quotes Psalm 82, 6 and John 10, 34. And if you believe the gods are just men in Psalm 82, why would Jesus quote this psalm to defend his deity? You know, because back in verse 30, he says, I and my father are one. And they're not, I mean, the Jews who are listening to that aren't thinking, well, I agree with God, too. We have the same thoughts. and I, I have the same, you know, predilections and goals that God does. You know, it's not this meaning of the minds thing. They pick up stones to stone him. They're, they're not going to stone him for, for being in agreement with God because they're going to think they're in agreement with God, too. Rather, he quotes the passage to say, hey, dudes, you know, you're, your own scripture says that that a phrase like son of God can sometimes mean more than a man, doesn't it? Psalm 82. Mm -hmm. and, and then he goes on to say, not only am I and the father one, but two verses later after he quotes Psalm 82, he says, the father is in me and I'm in the father. I'm actually the Lord of the council. So, you know, like do something with that. And, you know, and, and they get just as mad at the end. So, you know, again, I, I have yet to find a New Testament scholarly commentary by an evangelical who will affirm in John chapter 10 what I just described to you. All of them that I've ever run into. If you, if you find one, send it to me. I'd, I'd love to see it. But all of them will say the gods in Psalm 82 are just men. And so Jesus is saying, look, your own scripture says that, that, you know, I can call myself a son of God because you're sons of God, too. We're all sons of God. We're all one happy family here. You know, that, would, that has Jesus backing off verse 30. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got news for you. That's not the way the Jews are reading it. And no. Jesus does not back off. So well, he amen. gives it to them both barrels. Now, you've written an academic paper on that. Is that available? Yeah. If people go to the, the naked Bible podcast.com and it's it's actually episode 109. So if you if you Google that naked Bible podcast.com Jesus Psalm 82 or something like that, 
or go to the to the podcast site and look for um, episode 109. On that page, you not only get the podcast episode, you'll get me narrating a slide presentation about John 10 and the paper you just alluded to. Mm. It was a yeah, it was an academic paper I read at a regional society of biblical literature meeting um, mm. a few years ago. So that's there too. So the bottom line, Psalm 82, courtroom scene in heaven, God passes judgment on rebellious mm-hmm. entities who have not been administering his creation earth justly. Correct. And the sentence is literally the death of the small g gods. Yeah. And since the, it, it, at the end of the psalm, when the psalmist, you know, says he, the psalmist ends by this proclamation, this plea, this, you know, plaintive, you know, begging God to rise up and take the nations and judge, or judge the nations. You know, that's linked to what we call the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, which is, again, the, the Gentile nations who are in opposition to Israel. And that's linked in by Paul in Romans 11. The fullness of the Gentiles is linked to the reawakening of Israel. This is all eschatological in judgment. So when, when the Great Commission is accomplished and Israel has its reawakening, then the Lord will return and the end will come and the gods will be destroyed. I mean, all these things go together. But but again, you you you, you sort of eviscerate that little ball of theology of half of its ingredients if you're denying what Psalm 82 actually says. Mm. Fascinating stuff. It makes the Old Testament uh, a lot easier to understand, and it makes reading the Bible a lot more interesting and exciting. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, author of The Unseen Realm, Reversing Hermon, many other books, uh, his website, drmsh.com. Mike, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule for us. Yeah, absolutely. That is just mind-boggling, oh, that, that whole concept right there. That, that really got us on, on the track that we are now. Oh, it, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, and this is just a relatively recent thing, and I, I wrote about this in The Second Coming of Saturn, is that the phrase translated the divine counsel in Psalm 82, verse 1, in the Hebrew is adat el, which can be rendered the assembly of el. Which is even more chilling if you think that Yahweh, the creator God, the single, mm-hmm. never was created. He created everything. If he shows up in the fallen right. realms council. Right. Hey, guys, guess what? I would argue that that happened. Yeah. At the transfiguration. That's, that's a really good point. I would argue that that happened. Because the assembly of El, El was in Hebrew, a generic term that came to mean God. But that's because it was inherited from the older Semitic language is spoken by the Amorites around ancient Israel. El was the name of their creator God, not to be confused with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. So if this is correct, and there are some more recent English translations where the translators openly say, yeah, we've taken it to mean this, that God of the Bible, Yahweh, suddenly appears in the midst of the assembly of this fallen entity called El, the God of the Canaanites, and tells all of his minions Mm-hmm. Though you are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High, you know, in other words, I created you. Like men, you will die. Yes. Like, think about that. This is like, th- like the, the Avengers movies on steroids. I know, it is so incredible. And that's why we want to learn these things. And I get excited about these things because they get excited, not just us. I believe your kids and grandkids will find all of this really exciting as well. So if you are interested in learning more about Dr. Heiser's work, you can go to skywatchtvstore.com. Just type Heiser in the search uh, uh, oh, box, yeah, yeah. and you'll find a lot of books there. But we have a Bible's Greatest Mystery package. Yes, we do. And we'll tell you a little bit about it here and then tell you how to get it. But uh, this is re- specific to the Book of Enoch. Mike has written two companions, Volumes 1 and Volume 2, to the Book of Enoch, which uh, we understand is not in the Bible, and there are reasons for that, but it's referenced throughout the New Testament and specifically quoted mm-hmm. in the Book of Jude, the, the, the Epistle of Jude. So we've got the Book of Enoch in here as well, so you can read along with Mike and his commentary on the Book of Enoch, and t- as a sort of a, an introduction... Uh, Mike gave an interview with Stephen, to Stephen Bankars. Stephen Bankars is a, uh, was a former New Age teacher, young man, but brilliant. And he was very popular in the New Age mm-hmm. m- community, uh, was making a lot of money through his website. He was. He gave, he it, gave it all it up. up. Gave it all up 
uh, co-authored with our friend Josh Peck, the book mm -hmm. Second Coming of the New Age. Stephen and Mike sat down to talk about why the Book of Enoch is important, and um, this is a good introduction, especially for those who are not familiar with the Book of Enoch and why it's relevant. And then, of course, we've got the other resources for a deep dive. We'll tell you how to get that right now and uh, when we come back more on, on our turkey. turkey tour when the Bible's Greatest Mysteries continues. Call now and get the companion to the Book of Enoch special collection featuring the original Book of Enoch in beautifully bound hardback edition and both of Dr. Michael Heiser's groundbreaking companion guides to the Book of Enoch along with the shocking expose, Fallen Angels and Ancient Aliens on DVD. This is an exclusive offer for our Skywatch television audience. Yours for a donation of $35 plus shipping and handling. Volumes 1 and 2 of the companion guides to Enoch unveil what most of the modern church has never heard regarding how the sin of the watchers in Enoch 6 through 16 helped frame the mission of Jesus, how the descriptions of the Antichrist, the Messiah, the end times day of the Lord, and the final judgment connect to Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. This and so much more. Plus, you will also receive on DVD the Book of Enoch, Fallen Angels and Ancient Aliens, an exclusive production with Dr. Michael Heiser regarding the blatant lies of ancient astronaut theory and the horrifying nature of fallen angels and alien abduction. This DVD is a must have, but that's not all. You'll also receive the beautifully printed hardback edition of the original historical Book of Enoch from Defender Publishing. Perfect for assisting serious researchers and students in the study of the Bible and the early age. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of $90. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling while supplies last. Whether you've read the Book of Enoch or want to journey through it for the first time, without a doubt, you'll find the companion to the Book of Enoch special collection absolutely essential. Order now at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985. The Bible's Greatest Mysteries is part of Skywatch TV. Follow us online at skywatchtv.com. Boy, oh boy, this is... Wow. I, I, I am sorry that we come to the end of the four weeks with uh, Mike Heiser, but I we are too. grateful that we've had the opportunity to, uh, to get to know Mike, to become friends with Mike. Yeah. I even play in Mike's uh, fantasy baseball league every year. He's the commissioner of our league which I won last year. Yeah, he calls his... Uh, <laughs> his team, his name for his pug, Norman, so he calls his team Norman Bats. Oh, Mike's got a dry Mark. sense of humor. Okay, that's an old people story. <laughs> <laughs> many, many Norman Bates. Yes, yeah, yes. Pretty funny. But you can go to Turkey with us if you want to. You need to send us a note at bgmsskywatchtv.com very quickly to let us know because that tour is filling up Fast. Yes. We'll be uh, traveling around Turkey with uh, our special guest, Doug Hershey, who's the author of the best-selling coffee table books, Israel Rising and Jerusalem Rising. Beautiful yeah. books. Uh, Doug is the uh, head of a tour company, Ezra Adventures, and uh, leads tours to Israel. But with the travel restrictions to Israel, uh, we noticed that, hey, you're, you're leading groups to Turkey. We would like to go to Turkey. Uh -huh. And so we put together an itinerary, and he said, this is so compelling and so interesting. I'm coming with you. Imagine so, that. Yeah. That someone who can go anytime he wants to saw our list right. and said, I want to be with you. One of the places we're going is Hagia Sophia, which is, and mm. I'm probably mispronouncing the, 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 it's like Hagia Sophia sometimes. Right, right. Um, it was built as a church, and now it has yes. mosque additions to it. Right. The Emperor Justinian, back in the 6th century AD, built it. This was right. not long. He built that right after the 536 AD event. Right. Or during it. Mm -hmm. Not long after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it was uh, just an absolutely magnificent church. Now, Justinian had a bit of an ego problem. It's reported that he said once he saw the completed Hagia Sophia, <laughs> Solomon, I have outdone you. Like, um, no, God gave the uh, dimensions and the plans to Solomon for, for the temple in Jerusalem. Well, after that, there was a big plague, so... Mm. Yeah, you're right. The Justinian's, Justinian's plague. plague. Yes, exactly. Well, um, uh, So you can go to that church with us. You can also go on a cruise of the Bosphorus, mm -hmm. which takes you through that, that straits. It's, it's the first sort of narrow doorway that eventually leads to the Black Sea. Right. I look forward to that. Uh, the Church's Revelation... 
and uh, Gobekli Tepe, uh, mm -hmm. certainly a bucket list item, the world's oh, oldest uh, temple, they say, except that Karahan Tepe, and we'll see artifacts from that in one of the archaeological museums we'll visit, is even older than, and th they're in I the know. same region, and, and this is something I sort of touch on in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, that same region, uh, that general area is, appears to be the point of origin for the worship of this old entity, Saturn, Kronos, L. Mm -hmm. The Hurrians who came from that area or settled in that area called him Kumarbi. Mm -hmm. And uh, a key point of his worship was this, this idea that they had to uh, dig a ritual pit and then summon these entities, these spirits from the netherworld, yes. which is a practice that drew the Israelites into this uh, cultic practice for centuries. And there may be one reason why the Mount Hermon uh, summit has that scooped out area, not just right. for the ritual of pouring in the water for the dead, but also to reach the dead. Exactly. So um, we'll be talking and teaching about all of this throughout the tour. We'll visit Abraham's hometown of Haran mm -hmm. and uh, San Liurfo, which is a possibility for Ur of the Chaldees. The evidence suggests Ur Abraham did not come from southeast Iraq. He was not a Sumerian. He came from northern Mesopotamia. I think when you look at a map and you, you are actually there, we get to be there uh, with the, you if you get to go, um, that I think it will make sense. Yeah. It will make yeah. more sense. So there's a lot of history there. Turkey is an amazing, and because it is a, a central part of the letters to those churches, mm -hmm. they were all in Asia Minor, all of them in Turkey, and all of them very close to one another. So you have to ask, why Turkey? Yeah. Well, we're going to go to Turkey and try to find out. Oh, why. yeah. And we also, we, we forgot to mention, we'll be visiting Antakya, which is ancient Antioch, which yes. is where Christians were first called by that Christian. name. And from there, you can see Mount Tsafan, Jebel al Akra, which everyone in the ancient world knew was where Baal's palace was located. Oh, my gosh. And where the Greeks believed Zeus defeated the chaos god Typhon. Ah, so, but you know who defeated all of them? Jesus Christ. Amen, he, amen. Who created them in the first place. Exactly. And ultimately, at the end of the day, no matter how many questions still remain when our Lord and Savior returns to put it all right, He is the ultimate answer to the Bible's greatest mysteries. Yes, amen.